Um, so welcome to Grand Rounds this morning. Uh, the title today is Coaching in Medical Education, Taking Your Clinical Supervision to the Next Level. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Jeff. I'm one of the fourth year emergency medicine residents, and I've been spending my extra time this year um, focusing on medical education. I'm doing a master's in uh, med ed through the University of Dundee and also uh, involved in the Health Education Scholar Program at the University of Ottawa. Um, so really, uh, coaching right now is a very hot topic in medicine and medical education. And the goal of today is really just to uh, introduce the concept of coaching within medicine and try and demonstrate to you how it can be applied um, effectively by frontline clinicians uh, and learners to really improve the educational experience within the emergency department. Um, so before we get started, just a few acknowledgements. So a big thanks to Warren Chung, who was uh, my supervisor for the talk and has been uh, a great mentor for me in terms of all of my medical education interests. And then I wanted to mention as well Denise Richardson. So she's a physiatrist uh, out of Toronto and is a clinician educator with the Royal College. Um, and she's been involved in developing the Royal College uh, coaching framework. So some of the uh, figures have been borrowed uh, from her slides. And then uh, also thanks to Jason, who's uh, in Australia right now at a conference, but uh, he's provided lots of advice on coaching and has supported uh, all of my medical education interests as well. Okay, so here's the plan for what we're going to chat about today. Um, so in part one, uh, it's all about defining coaching and clarifying some of the competing terminology, because um, there's a few terms that are thrown around in the med ed literature um, around coaching, and uh, I think it's helpful just to get a good definition of what it means. And then um, we're going to review uh, a little bit of the evidence uh, within medical education on coaching and how it's being studied right now. And then in the third part, we're going to get into CBD, so coaching uh, in competency by design, which is uh, the new curriculum that's being introduced in July for the Royal College residents. And then in the last part, we're going to try and make it really practical for everybody and talk about how to coach on shift. And we're going to focus on um, what the supervisor can do as faculty members as, and as well as what you can do as a learner um, to optimize your experience. So a little bit of a disclaimer. Um, this was me last year. We talked all about renal colic. Um, it was a great time, and we got really into all the studies and took a deep dive into the meta-analyses on Flomax and uh, distal stones, and it was really fun. Um, but unfortunately today, there aren't too many RCTs. There's a couple, but not too many. Um, so meta-ed is different. Um, it really can be considered a social science. And a lot of the evidence and studies that we use in medical education are observational or qualitative as opposed to quantitative. Um, but I hope you'll still appreciate the talk and the evidence because it's really important. Um, you know, we, we are all involved in teaching and learning on a daily basis in an academic center, um, and it impacts what we do on shift. Um, so I think uh, with that in mind, let's jump into the talk. Okay, so part one. Uh, what is coaching? So let's clarify the terminology. Um, so to get started, I'm going to show you guys a video clip. And while you're watching this clip, I want you to watch Federer do what he does and think about some of the factors that have contributed to his success. Federer just went into a mode that I honestly didn't know he had in him anymore. I'm not sure that Roger Federer, even after the 17 years I've been watching him and had the privilege to experience his tennis, I don't think I've ever seen him play better, ever. And I just didn't think what he did today was possible. So lay down, slowly, it's the Incredibile, ma vero, da archiviare, colpo impossibile. Oh, 
Okay, so I think it's safe to say that we would all agree Federer is one of the best at what he does. So how is he so good? Well, he undoubtedly possesses athleticism, aptitude, lots of dedication and perseverance, but there's another factor to consider. He has a coach. In fact, Federer has a whole team of coaches that work on every aspect of his game with the goal of performance enhancement. And in a recent tribute on social media, Federer wrote, could never have been the oldest number one without my team. Thanks to everyone who's helped me along the way. So take a minute and ask yourself the following questions. Are you any good at what you do? And how do you know? How do you know what you need to improve on? And who's gonna tell you that? So coaching is pervasive in athletics as well as other high performance endeavors, including music, business, but what about our environment? What about what we do here? We all know that emergency medicine is a high performance specialty. We work in an unpredictable environment where decisions need to be made and actions need to be taken in a time sensitive manner. And our current model of training places learners in this environment for a designated amount of time and with variable amounts of supervision. And then at the end of our training, as a new faculty, we enter our professional career and are expected to perform at our best on day one. But as medical professionals, are we really reaching our peak performance? And how are we ever gonna know if no one's watching us work? So many of you will be familiar with the name Atul Gawande. Uh, for those of you who aren't, he's a general surgeon based out of Harvard and also a best-selling author and writes a, also writes a series for The New, York, the New Yorker. Um, he's also the guy behind the World Health Organization Surgical Safety Checklist, which has become standard of care across the world. In 2011, Gwandi felt like he'd reached a plateau in the operating room. His complication rates had been stable for years, and he just felt like he wasn't getting any better. So he got himself a coach. He enlisted a retired surgeon who watched them operate every day. And after the cases, they would sit down, review films, and meticulously go through his performance in the operating room and look for areas to get better. Gwandi was so impressed with this experience that he started thinking more broadly about coaching. And he went on to say this, coaching done well may be the most effective intervention designed for human performance. It's a pretty bold quote. So, I have a little clip from an interview with Gawande on coaching. In this clip, he's talking about the difference between our traditional model of training in medicine and a coaching type model. And while you're watching this, ask yourself which model you would prefer to be a part of. We have two very different ways that we think education happens for adult learners. Uh, one concept is that you go to school, you learn everything, and then you're released into the world. You are now responsible for the rest of your education. And then there's the sports version, which says, you know what, you're never going to learn unless you have a coach all the way. And what I realized, I was in the midpoint in my career, that um, I had kind of plateaued. And what I wondered was what would it be um, to bring a coach into my operating room. And so we I brought a, one of my colleagues into the operating room who would watch me and tell me what I was doing well, what I wasn't do well, doing well. And it was amazing the things I hadn't recognized I was doing. I wasn't using the lights well. I hadn't set up the field as well as I could have. That there were these little things that um, he saw from his own experience that helped me understand. The biggest criticism has been that I wasn't really effective at listening. And it actually played through and I realized in my own patient conversations. I was talking 90% of the time, and it's because I wasn't asking enough questions. And then I carried it over to looking at how I was with my own team, and I was doing 90% of the talking. I'm working on getting it below 50%. <laughs> I'm there with my patients. I'm hopefully almost there with the team, too. <laughs> so based on this study, we can see which model Gwandi is a believer in. He felt so strongly about coaching that he's now incorporated it into his public health work with the World Health Organization. In this study, low resource birthing centers in India were randomized to receive an eight month coaching based 
implementation of a safe childbirth checklist. And the results showed that the coaching improved adherence to the safe childbirth checklist and has the potential to decrease infant mortality in these very low resource settings. So what about coaching in medical education? Well, it's actually not a new concept. So coaching during emergency medicine training was first brought up back in 2010, and some of you will recognize the authors of this paper. And in this opinion piece, they argue that coaching can move the emergency department educational experience beyond the good jobs and the read mores. But the concept of coaching never really gained a lot of popularity in medical education until more recently. And that's because competency-based medical education, which is um, the broader term used to describe CBD, has really put a, an emphasis on observation and direct observation in terms of assessment. And that's renewed an interest in coaching within medical education. So more on that to come. But first, let's define what coaching is. So here's a long definition from a uh, book, like from a textbook on coaching. So it's a one-to-one -one conversation focused on the enhancement of learning and development through increasing self-awareness and a sense of personal responsibility where the coach facilitates the self-directed learning of the learner through questioning, active listening, and appropriate challenge in a supportive and encouraging climate. That's a really long definition, and I don't expect anybody, including myself, to remember that. Um, but you can break it down into its core elements and make it much more operational. So here's the definition that we use. So it's a conversation that occurs between a supervisor and a learner, and it's based on an observation. It incorporates feedback, and it leads to actionable suggestions for performance enhancement. So the whole goal of coaching is to get your learner to the next level. And this is how it breaks down. So first, you need to have some form of observation where a determination of quality is made. So for example, you're working a shift with a learner and you watch them reduce a boxer's fracture and place the hand in an ulnar gutter splint. That's your observation. Next, you need to provide some feedback on what was observed compared to the expected standard. So in our example, you may provide the feedback that the learner took twice as long as would be expected to reduce that fracture and place it in an appropriate splint. And then the added piece is the coaching piece, which is where you encourage self-reflection and give actionable suggestions and for performance enhancement. So in our example, the learner may reflect and say, it took them a long time to place that hand in the appropriate splint because they didn't know where any of the materials were and they had to go searching for it. So in that, in that case, as a coach, you would provide the suggestion that, well, why don't you stay for 10 minutes at the end of your urgent care shift, find the splinting material, know where it is, and then next time you'll be able to do that procedure more efficiently. And then you can take it to the next level and actually demonstrate to them um, how you set up your equipment so that you can do that procedure on your own in a time efficient manner. So remember that coaching is observation, feedback, and then actionable suggestions for improvement. But there's two other terms that are often used interchangeably and are confused in the literature and that's teaching and mentoring. So we're gonna talk about each one so that we have a clear sense of how they differentiate from each other. So mentoring refers to a confidential, non-judgmental relationship between two individuals where the mentee is encouraged to take charge of their own development. And within medicine, mentoring typically comes in the form of guidance and support offered by a more experienced colleague. Mentoring tends to have a more conversational tone, and it can cover a broad range of topics, including career development, scholarship, and work-life balance. And I'm sure many of you can relate to this through our own mentorship program uh, within the Department of Emergency Medicine. And then there's teaching. So the teaching can be defined as the process through which you impart knowledge. So for example, when you're working on shift and you sit down with a learner and you look at an ECG and you review the 10 causes, uh, deadly causes of syncope that you can diagnose on an ECG, that's teaching. You're not coaching them because you're not observing them, you're not giving them feedback or suggestions, you're just imparting knowledge. So that's an example of teaching. So let's look at these side by side. So first, mentoring. So the focus is on an individual you with a goal of giving advice and guidance. And it's typically longitudinal over time. And again, we have a good conception of what mentoring means based on our own mentorship program. And 
it's a conversational approach. It occurs over dinner, lunch, beers, things like that. Coaching is within the clinical context. It's individual and it's all about performance enhancement. It can occur in the moment on shift or longitudinally over time. And we'll talk about that more later on in the talk. And it's collaborative. So the thing with coaching is that both parties need to be actively involved. It's not a one-way type of interaction. Contrast that with teaching. So teaching can occur in a classroom setting as a group or on an individual basis on shift. And the goal is a knowledge acquisition. And it can also occur in the moment or over time. But it takes a more directive approach where you're literally just imparting knowledge onto someone. Okay, so that was an introduction to coaching and some of the competing terminology. And I hope you have a sense now of where coaching can potentially fit into medical education. In this next part, we're just going to take a look at a few select studies on coaching just to show you um, what the literature is doing right now in terms of uh, medical education and coaching. So this is really just an interesting observational piece of work. It was done by two internists at Hopkins where they just watched high-performance coaches from different running teams. And then they interviewed those coaches and identified some common themes and tried to tie it back into what they do as supervisors uh, in the clinical context. And they had a few take-home points. Um, and they're not exactly rocket science. So the first thing is you need to understand your learner. And then you need to model and role model the qualities that you seek to instill. And then finally, you need to communicate clearly and consistently. This will probably seem familiar to a lot of you because these three principles are actually built into the ED stat or ED star model that was developed by John Sherbonneau and Jason Frank. So there's a lot of similarities um, in terms of the core principles around uh, some of these uh, models. So this next study is a narrative literature review that was published uh, recently in 2017 in medical education. It looked at several databases including PubMed, Medline, Web of Science, all the way from 1960 up until 2017. They initially found about 1,000 papers and narrowed it down to 21 for their detailed analysis, and they included qualitative and quantitative studies. This review really shows that uh, there's developing evidence base for coaching in both technical and non-technical skills. And intuitively, the technical skills seem more amendable to coaching. It's easy to draw comparisons between athletics and music to the technical skills in medicine, the procedural things that we do. But I think it's also important to recognize that coaching has a role in non-technical skills, and there's an emerging evidence base for this. Um, this could include things like crisis resource management, ED flow, um, how to break bad news and have difficult conversations with patients. These are all non-technical skills that may be amendable to coaching interactions. Some of the best evidence for coaching to date in the literature comes from the surgical realm. This systematic review screened over 3,000 studies, eventually narrowing it down to 23 that met their inclusion criteria. And they broke down the outcomes of these studies into four different categories perceptions and attitudes on coaching, technical skills such as not tying in the operating room, non-technical skills like crisis resource management, and finally, performance measures that were based on patient-centered outcomes. So let's take a closer look at this last one because it's interesting. So they had seven studies that were included in this systematic review that reported patient-centered outcomes such as morbidity and mortality as well as operative complications. Five out of the seven studies demonstrated an improvement in these outcomes after the coaching intervention. Unfortunately, these were non-randomized studies and had a huge risk of bias when you actually look at the methodology that was used. So I think the only real takeaway at this point is that coaching interventions are safe. They don't seem to cause any harm, um, but we can't say for sure that they lead to improved patient outcomes at this point, given that these studies were so poorly done. The final paper uh, that I want to introduce in this section is really just here to serve as a reminder that coaching has implications along the continuum of a medical professional's career. So this was an educational innovation paper where a formalized coaching program was instituted for newly graduated hospitalist physicians based out of Harvard. So these were early career hospitalist physicians. And they were assigned a coach who was a senior internist. And they met with their coach every day and they would review the list 
They would talk about clinical decisions, review patient-specific data, and the coach would provide some just general advice around uh, things relevant to patient care. Based on the qualitative data that was gathered for this study, this type of coaching program improved diagnostic accuracy, testing efficiency, and actually avoided a lot of unnecessary in-hospital consultations. So I think the main take home from that study is really that learning does not end with our residencies. And coaching has implications for continuing professional development. And that faculty coaching programs are being developed and studied right now. And they're starting to appear in the literature. So in this next part, we're going to talk about coaching and competency by design. So remember that Competency by Design is the Royal College's version of competency-based medical education, which has been adopted worldwide. But to understand how coaching fits in, we just need to do a very quick refresher on CBD. So this slide should look familiar. familiar. It's been presented a few times at rounds as well as departmental meetings. And this shows how CBD will look starting in July. So residents enter now a transition to discipline, and they progress through these phases of training and eventually into their professional careers. And in this new model, there's less emphasis on time and more emphasis on whether or not the resident is achieving the competencies that they need to achieve to be a safe practitioner when they leave the training program. Within CBD, there's three really important principles that have implications for coaching. So we're just going to look at those three before we get into how coaching fits in. This is the first principle. So learners move on a developmental arc as you progress from a novice to more competent, and then eventually, hopefully, for all of us, expert. Learners are not expected to be expert on day one. And CBD is trying to emphasize this point, recognizing that people start in the novice level and then move along this arc. And the idea behind coaching is that it can help people transition on this arc smoothly and take people to the next level along this process to eventually achieving expertise in their specialty. The second principle is all about mindset. So for coaching to be successful in medical education, learners have to maintain what's known as a growth mindset rather than a fixed mindset. So these terms were coined by Carol Dweck who's a psychology professor based out of Stanford, and it's used to describe people's approaches to learning. So if you have a fixed mindset, you approach situations with a judgmental lens, you're really worried about how you're going to look. Are you going to look stupid? Are you going to look bad if you don't know how to do something? And these individuals don't value challenging situations, and they shy away from them if they don't think that they're going to be performing well. Contrast that with a growth mindset. So an individual with a growth mindset looks for opportunities to grow as a result of taking on challenges. They learn from feedback and crave feedback, and they want to know how to improve. Individuals with a growth mindset also recognize that getting better takes work. It's not easy, and they embrace it. <coughs> the growth mindset is really where we all want to be. The last CBD principle to be aware of is around how we frame assessment. So the word assessment is meted lingo, and it describes the process of gathering and analyzing information on a learner to measure their performance. And in our current curriculum, learners and faculty are often engaged in assessment of learning. And this is otherwise known as summative assessment. This is the type of assessment that promotes judgment. It's when um, learners are hesitant to ask for help and show vulnerability because they fear that it's going to impact their progression. In CBD, there needs to be a paradigm shift. We need to move towards assessment for learning or formative types of assessment. The purpose of assessment for learning is lower stakes. It's more frequent and it's embedded throughout the residency process. And it encourages learners to embrace their weaknesses and use coaching as a means to improve their performance in a safe learning environment. So within competency by design, there's two types of coaching and we touched on this a bit earlier. So coaching in the moment describes the coaching that occurs in the clinical environment following an observation. So this is the type of coaching that senior residents and faculty physicians will be doing with their learners on shift. 
Coaching over time describes something a little bit different. It's a longitudinal relationship and partnership between a clinician and a learner. And coaching over time uses pre-scheduled face-to-face discussions where decisions are made with the faculty supervisor about how things are going and how the learner is progressing through the competency-based program. And they involve coaching conversations. So all faculty members in the new curriculum are going to be involved in coaching in the moment. This is what you're going to be doing on shift with your learners. Coaching over time um, is typically something done by a select group of faculty members. In our case, it will most likely be our program director and clinical competency committee members. So we're going to get into coaching in the moment in more detail. Um, But first, I just wanted to share with you this program of research because I think it serves as a good example of how coaching over time can be operationalized and how medical education innovations can be scholarly and disseminated broadly. So these, are, this is a series of three papers um, that describes the R2C2 model. So this is a model um, that was developed by a group of Canadian researchers um, based out of Calgary. And it provides a structured approach to coaching over time which are those scheduled meetings that you have um, with your coach as you progress through your residency. So this model has been implemented and is currently being studied uh, internationally. And the preliminary data from these studies, without getting into the model specifically, is showing that R2C2 is effective in fostering productive and reflective um, feedback conversations, and it's a good example of coaching over time. Although there's no outcome data at this point to suggest that it actually improves learner outcomes. Okay, so now that we know the key principles around coaching and the different types of coaching, let's see how it fits into CBD. So first, we have our EPAs and our milestones. So within competency by design, learners are going to have explicit goals and objectives that are set out by their EPAs. So an EPA is an essential task of a given specialty. So learners will come to, their, come to shifts with an idea of what EPA they want to work on. And these are assessed in the workplace. So they show up, they have a sense of what EPAs they want to accomplish, and this is what frontline clinicians are going to be assessing on shift. And this is where coaching in the moment is going to fit in. So coaching in the moment, again, happens when you're working with learners around their EPAs. So they're going to have an objective, you're going to watch them, you're going to give them feedback, you're going to have a coaching conversation. And all of that coaching that occurs on shift is then documented and placed into that resident's e-portfolio. And the e-portfolio is a repository of all the assessments that that and, and EPAs that that uh, resident has achieved to that date. And this is where coaching over time can fit in. So again, coaching over time is going to be with a specific faculty member where they're able to sit down with that learner go over that e-portfolio, review what they've accomplished so far, and how they can move on to the next level. And finally, all that information gets gathered up and sent over to the competency committee. And the competency committee is the committee that's in charge of all the high stakes uh, decisions. So they're the ones that look at all the information together and make objective decisions around residency progression throughout the training. So this is putting, um, putting the same idea just in a different format. So again, we have resident learning at the center with everything being documented in the e-portfolio. And then coaching figures prominently with both coaching over time and coaching in the moment. And then all that data gets fed back to our clinical competency committee. So this is what it's going to look like starting in July um, for our new Royal College residents. Okay. So we just introduced a whole bunch of new terminology, and I know it's kind of confusing. So let's make it really practical and look, a bit, look to see how coaching can be operationalized on shift by frontline clinicians. So to do this, we're going to use an example. So you're working in urgent care at the Civic with a PGY2 FR emergency medicine resident. Your resident is looking after Tim. This is Tim. He's upset because he fell while playing basketball, and he's got a lateral mal fracture. So you haven't, as a supervisor, haven't personally seen Tim, but you've discussed the case 
with your resident, you've looked at the x-ray, and the two of you decided that Tim needs to be placed in a lower extremity splint. So you assume that because they're a PGY2 level, they should be able to perform this basic procedure. But in reality, the residents only put on one of these splints way back during their orientation week in PGY1. But they're too uncomfortable to tell you that because they're afraid that it's going to reflect poorly on them in their, assist, in their assessment. They have a fixed mindset, and they're looking at it with more of a judgment lens. So they go ahead, they go to the plaster room on their own, they put Tim in a terrible lower extremity splint, and unfortunately it's not padded, and Tim returns three days later, and he's got a bad ulcer that's formed, which requires antibiotics and multiple repeat visits to, um, to the uh, plaster room to follow up with ortho. So not exactly an ideal outcome in this fairly simple uh, clinical scenario. So what happened here? Is it the resident's fault for not speaking up and asking for help? Well, I think that plays a role because we all need to know our own limitations. But let's consider some of the system issues at play. So our current system of training is analogous to steeping tea in a pot. So the system assumes that after steeping for a certain amount of time, all learners are going to come out at the end with all the necessary competencies they need to perform their specialty. But unfortunately, as we've seen in our example, lots of learners progress at different rates. Not everyone achieves those competencies at the same time. And you can get into trouble if you're assuming that people know things without them ever actually demonstrated that they know how to do that. So in this example, the resident was worried that asking for help would show, be seen as a sign of weakness and reflect in negative judgment. But this is how our system is currently set up. We have this fear of showing weakness and not um, being perfect at everything. In the new CBD curriculum, we hope that this example would change, where the resident would see this case as an opportunity to receive coaching and to improve their skills uh, in a non-judgmental environment. So how do we make this happen? This is the Royal College framework on how to operationalize coaching in the moment. So you can remember it using the mnemonic RxOCD. It stands for Rapport, Expectations, Observation, Conversation, and Document. So we're going to go through each one now. So we know from the ED stat model that building rapport with learners is important. And it's no different when you're coaching on shift. As supervisors, you want to form an educational alliance with your learner, really emphasizing on development and not on judgment. And this is going to encourage your learners to shift towards that growth mindset. So a great way to set the stage is to tell your learner to think of you as their coach when you meet them for the first time. And then you want to clarify expectations. So this will entail discussing the specific learning objectives and goals that the resident would like to achieve. So for CBD residents, they're likely going to have specific EPAs that they're working on, and they're going to tell you that. So just like a lot of you do right now, establishing rapport and expectations can be done at the beginning of the shift with your learner. And I know a lot of us already do this. The next piece is around observation. So observation is critical to coaching in the moment. It's very difficult to coach someone if you haven't seen what they've done. So this doesn't mean that as a supervisor you now need to follow your learner around the entire shift but it's about being strategic and finding discrete moments during the shift when you can watch them do something. After that observation, you want to have a conversation with them. So the learner, because it's a two-way street, really needs to reflect on their performance, and the supervisor needs to be able to provide some actionable suggestions for improvement. This is where we want to move away from just the good jobs and read mores. As a supervisor, you need to provide specific suggestions to help that person get better at what they're working on. And then the final component to the RX OCD, OCD model is the documentation piece. So everything that gets documented is compiled into that resident's e-portfolio. And then that's made available for coaching over time and the clinical competency committee. So it's very important that all these, the hard work that's done on shift in terms of coaching gets documented. It's also important to remember that you're only required to document what you observed with that learner. You're not responsible and don't need to worry about making any overall judgments in terms of how that resident is progressing in their training program. It's all about what you observed that day. And it just forms one small picture, pixel of that resident's overall competence, 
So people are allowed to have off days. People are allowed not to uh, get the LP on their first try because they're going to have many other opportunities, many other observations that are going to demonstrate that they are competent at that task. So with respect to the documentation, we have two new um, forms that are going to be filled uh, starting in July. So we have a new platform, which many of you have heard about, which is called Entrata. And this is what's going to be used for the new Royal College residents to document their EPAs and the coaching conversations that take place. And then Warren, as many of you will know, has been working on a new deck, um, which is going to be available on 145. And the new deck is what's going to be used for all the other residents um, and can be also be used for um, the, the new Royal College residents, which gives an overall assessment of how the shift went. And this is where you can also document coaching conversations for residents that aren't in the new curriculum. So what are some of the barriers to coaching in the emergency department? We all know that it's busy, so there's clinical multitasking that takes place, and there's flow pressures, constant interruptions that can make it difficult to observe people work. And there's also multiple learners. And we'll, we have learners that are at different stages of training, ranging from PGY-5 down to uh, second and first year medical students that come with us. And people have different training backgrounds. Not everyone's been trained in Canada in a Canadian medical school. And then finally, there's something called the Hawthorne effect. So the Hawthorne effect describes changes in behavior as a motivational response to the attention received through observation. So this is something that's been described in the literature as a potential barrier to coaching. So what are some of the solutions? Well, like I mentioned, you don't need to follow around your learners for the entire shift. Just find some discrete teaching moments. There's usually some time, especially at the beginning of shifts, um, where this can be accomplished. And not every learner in the emergency department needs to be coached. If you have someone um, who is just starting out, for example, a third-year medical student who has no approach to syncope, it actually may be better to sit down with them and do some traditional coaching on an approach to syncope as opposed to having them be observed try, attempting to take a syncope history from a patient when they have no framework or mental model to build on. So you need to be selective in terms of who you decide to do your coaching with. There's this concept called backstage observation. Um, some of people, like we tend to refer to it as like listening behind the curtain or something like that, where the learner isn't necessarily aware that they're being observed. So this is an option that's available to people. You should probably up front at the beginning of shift let the learner know that you're planning on doing some of this. Um, and it's been suggested that this may reduce that Hawthorne effect where people change their behavior if they know that they're being observed. Although I don't suspect the Hawthorne effect is going to be a big factor in terms of coaching because if you the, think about like the principle around coaching, it's really a non-judgmental, supposed to be observational to improve your performance um, and very formative. So um, if people have that growth mindset, then the Hawthorne, Hawthorne effect should not be an important factor to consider. In this last part, we're going to just give some tips for, as a learner, how to improve the coaching experience for you. So similar to the RX OCD model, there's another mnemonic that may or may not be helpful to you that can help frame what you want to do as a learner to improve your own coaching experience. And you can use the direct mnemonic. So we'll go through each step. So first, as a learner, you need to decide what you want to focus on that day. So you need to come into the shift with an idea of what you're hoping to accomplish. It's not up to your supervisor to decide what your objectives are that day. For the CBD residents, this should be pretty straightforward because they're going to have EPAs that they're keen to work on. And then following an observation, you need to reflect on your own performance. And it, it's important to be honest with yourself about your strengths and weaknesses and do a little mental debrief to consider what went well and what didn't go well. And remember that the growth mindset is all about not be, needing to be perfect the first time you do something. And then next, you want to make sure that you're eliciting feedback and coaching from your supervisor. Your supervisor should already be primed and ready to give you some suggestions for actionable, actionable suggestions for improvement, but make sure that this happens. And then you want to clarify any ambiguities. Remember that the whole idea behind coaching is to take your performance to the next level, and it's a two-way street. So it's, think of it as an educational alliance, and it's a collaborative effort. 
Um, so if you're not getting the feedback and the suggestions that you feel will be beneficial for you, make sure you clar do some clarification with your supervisor to optimize that experience for yourself. And finally, together with your coach, you want to make a plan. So formulate the suggestions for performance enhancement um, into an action plan and make sure you follow up on it. And you can take it from shift to shift. So in our model right now, we have clinical coaching um, or coaching teams, or sorry, clinical teaching teams. Maybe one day they'll be called coaching teams. Um, but if you're working multiple shifts with the same supervisor and they've given you some feedback or, and coaching around something that you didn't do um, at your peak the first time, then you can take that to your next shift and say, listen, I'm still really trying to work on this. Can, we, can you watch me do this again and give me some more feedback? And it's that taking it forward um, can really help you uh, improve your performance. Okay, so to summarize, um, coaching right now is a hot topic in medical education. It's very popular and it's showing up in the literature quite a bit. And it's important because it's going to figure prominently in the new Royal College curriculum that's starting in July. Remember that coaching in the moment incorporates these three things. So you need to have an observation, a feedback, and then actionable suggestions for improvement. For learners, or sorry, for staff, uh, to operationalize coaching in the moment, you can follow the RX OCD model, which is the model that's, being, um, that's been uh, developed by the Royal College and is what they're encouraging supervisors to use for coaching on shift. For learners, you really want to shift into that growth mindset, move away from a fixed mindset, and to help you optimize your own coaching experience, you can use the direct framework. If done properly, I really feel like coaching has the potential to unlock a learner's uh, optimal and peak clinical performance, but it needs to be a, a two-way effort. This isn't something that learners can do on their own or supervisors can push on to learners. It really needs to be a collaborative, collaborative effort where everyone has buy-in. Um, so I'd encourage you all to try out coaching on your next shift and let me know how it goes. So happy to take any questions and thanks for your attention.